first in a set of workshops that um, that we've designed as the data and policy analytics team um, with a focus on evaluation and impact. Um, so this is a unit that we're building within our unit at OPM. And our focus today is on building a data culture. And that's a really, really big task. So I want to state up front, and there's some caveats, and I'll, I'll say this over and over again, this work is a very long game. And for folks who have been doing this kind of work, whether it's um, directly you're in it, like you do the data work for your agency, or you're new to this work and just trying to really understand how to make data and evidence the focus of your work, just know that we're not going to solve everyone's problems today. But um, what we're doing is building a community of folks here in state government who care about doing this work and who will rely on one another as colleagues. For instance, my colleagues from DCP, Jay Cohen and I go back to my Connecticut data collaborative days um, where he was doing when I learned about the process improvement work that he was involved with. And now, you know, he knows that there's value in doing this work together. So he sent you to this workshop, which is fantastic. And this is just the beginning. Like I said, before we started recording, we'll run this workshop multiple times. Um, it's great for executive leadership. It's great to attend in teams. So just know that um, this is never like a one-shot situation. We can always talk about customizing this for a broader audience within your agency with your own agency um, features. So there's a couple goals I have for our conversation today. Um, the first is just to talk a little bit about why evidence now um, and why data is part of that evidence building activity. Um, and it's important to talk about that now because the funding that we have through the American Rescue Plan Act is actually a little bit different than some of the other federal funding that you might receive as your agency to run other projects that you receive. There's different kinds of requirements and there's a specific reason for those. So I wanted to talk through those a little bit. Then um, I wanted to talk about building a data culture, but I really think this is the beginning of something depending on where you are in this work. So I don't want anyone to feel as though they're standing at the bottom of a mountain and they're expected to be at the top by the end of this hour. Um, that would be an extraordinarily unreasonable expectation. Um, but one thing I've done I've, as I've been working with colleagues around state government, I've said to them, you know, in some ways we were being asked to run a marathon without sneakers. Um, if we don't build a data culture, um, we can't actually do this data and evidence-based work um, effectively. So I really am excited to be in conversation with you today. And just so you know, we have about 20 or so people um, many of whom did not receive this message directly. So I continue to be really excited um, as you join the conversation. Please just add in to the chat window um, your name, your role within your agency or project and your agency. And then finally, I'm hoping to outline a few action steps that you can adopt today. And like I said, these workshops are a work in progress. My hope is that between now and the next time we run this building a data culture workshop, I'll have a little bit of feedback and I'll be able to invest some more time in creating some tangible resources for you, whether that's worksheets or strategy guides or um, or resources in a in a linked document. Um, so remember, we're building and flying. All of us are building and flying at the same time. And this this particular capacity building effort is is no exception. A um, couple of things before we start. Um, we use lots of terms frequently in this work um, in the data and policy analytics unit. We use this use lots of these terms. I say interchangeably because sometimes when I say research, I do mean data. When I say analytics, I mean data. Um, they all have unique definitions. I'm not going to run through them all specifically, but if there's a question, if I've used something in a way that doesn't make sense, I really, I really ask that you stop me and just, you know, we're in a conversation, even though I'm doing a lot of the talking and I can't get the the facts across or the concepts across if they're confusing to you. There's no, there's no such thing as a basic question here. Um, I mean, all, we're all learners and, and we're all learning at the same time. Uh, like I said, that building this data culture takes a lot of time. I have experience, firsthand experience in an executive agency trying to do this work. And I've worked with other executive branch agencies in my work formerly at the data collaborative. So I know how hard this can be. And sometimes it can be a little bit lonely too. Like you feel like you're the only one who says, I know there's a problem with these data, but I don't know how to fix it. Or these data tell us something and I don't know how to take action. We're not going to solve everyone's challenges today, but we are going to get ourselves on a really nice path where we're kind of walking along together. Um, this work cannot be done alone, so I'm really glad that some folks have come in teams and I urge you to loop in colleagues, even colleagues who might not be in American Rescue Plan funded projects. I'm doing my best to keep this focused on that effort right now, but this is really very scalable and transferable to all agency business. Um, 
the work is allowable under the American Rescue Plan funding, which is why we're focused on those projects. But it doesn't mean that we need to keep all of this um, capacity building to ourselves. And um, the Data and Policy Analytics Unit at OPM is your partner in this work. So let me tell you a little bit about us. Um, and I'm going to share these materials with folks who attend after the meeting. So in addition to putting your, your names in the chat here, there's also like an attendance list that I can download, which I'll grab at some point. So don't worry. Um, if you didn't have the calendar invite directly or you just clicked on that flyer link, um, we'll find you and we'll share these things with you. Um, if we have a brand new website, um, so we're excited about that. It talks about all of our work. Um, we maintain the state's open data portal. My colleague Pauline Zaldonis is here today. That's her primary work. So that means any agency that's sharing data openly um, and transparently, your data um, appear on that portal um, and we're the ones responsible for its maintenance. Um, we manage the data sharing and uh, the data sharing arrangement P20WIN, um, that's our state's longitudinal data system. And there are about 10 plus agencies that sit together and work together on different kinds of um, data research questions and problems where we match data across agencies. Um, we actually have a brand new feature of our unit. Um, the geospatial information officer sits within our unit and all of the mapping and geospatial assets are in a different but adjacent data portal. So if you're looking for information that has a spatial component, that's something that we could support. We basically partner with agencies to provide analytical capacity, and we guide a lot of the best practices and governance around the use of data. So if you have a question, like in an earlier in our kickoff, we had a question about um, categories you can use um, when you collect demographic data, and I have some information to share back about that. So um, if you have a question about data, we are your partners. I want to pause right there, just make sure I didn't um, sort of, that was all the preamble. Now we're going to jump, jump into the meat and potatoes. Any questions, thoughts, feedback? Remember, you can always use um, the, the chat window if you have any questions as we go along. Seeing none, let's jump in. So um, for folks who don't have this background, who might not be on a project and come to us by way of the American Rescue Plan Act funding, this is an unprecedented infusion of funds and capital to states and municipalities. Um, Connecticut is actually one of a few that's involved in a learning community. So I'm working with two other states and about nine or so municipalities and counties from around the country to learn from one another as to how they're implementing um, these funds. These funds are a little different. If you have federal funders that you work with, like the CDC, the Administration for Children and Families, HUD, or others, you might already have federal funder relationships. The difference here is that these funds came to the state and OPM has been supportive in distributing these funds based on the legislative appropriations that happened at the end of last legislative session. So these funds are a little bit different in terms of the way they're the compliance and reporting happens because if you already as an agency have a relationship with your federal funder, you report right to them. Um, you don't typically go through OPM to do that. But in this case, OPM rolls up everyone's work here and reports to the Department of Treasury. So we received this $2.8 billion from the Treasury Department. Um, and that's that's one of the ways that the reporting is a little bit different because the Treasury Department has actually determined that they want to use the Evidence-Based Policymaking Act, which was passed technically in 2018, signed into law in 2019 at the federal level. And so the Evidence-Based Policymaking Act is, is actually a really fantastic piece of legislation because it prioritizes data and evidence-based or evidence-building activities. Um, whereas maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago, the federal government would spend funds and say, we did a great thing. The Evidence-Based Policymaking Act says we actually need to focus and shift, I'm gonna talk about this in a minute, um, our, our investments that we make to things that we know actually yield positive impact on our on our citizens across the country. So this is really an opportunity to improve data culture. It might not feel that way. Um, I've been in a lot of meetings with folks from around state government since I started in September, and I'm aware that uh, many of the appropriations happened um, with some agency involvement. So some agencies may be implementing projects that absolutely fulfill the missions and goals of your work. And I'm also aware that some people um, received, some agencies receive funds and they were appropriated them and maybe they don't exactly meet their goals or have, were not part of their strategic plans. 
the goal here is really to improve the way that we measure these funds. And so whether these came by way of appropriation um, or by choice, um, we're in this we're in this data culture building together. And I think that we should focus on that piece of things. Um, we have been in conversations where folks have said this isn't necessarily going to fulfill the goals that the legislature intended, and we understand that. Um, Treasury also has some different kinds of expectations around reporting that might be a little challenging. And so we can talk through some of that in a future conversation. So we're talking about evidence. Um, in this case, there's sort of two ways I'm thinking about evidence, and sometimes I call this data as well. Um, the US Treasury has actually had definitions of what they consider to be evidence. And for those researchers or applied researchers in the room, um, in some cases, you might not necessarily agree with these categories. As a social scientist, you know, I'm a social scientist, a sociologist of education. You know, I don't necessarily always believe that a random, a random um, controlled experiment is going to be the best uh, way to measure impact necessarily. But in this case, um, the US Treasury has actually designated what they call strong, moderate, and preliminary categories of evidence. Um, in our new allocation implementation form, we have great definitions, and we have a new flowchart that we can share explaining how to kind of just figure out, is this project what they call evidence-based? Is there a random, random controlled trial or some other experiment that produces positive findings? Are there non-experimental studies that produce positive findings? Or is there just regular research that doesn't necessarily explain how this is going to work um, in, in practical terms? Um, and we're here as your partners to help identify whether you have strong, moderate, or preliminary evidence. But people don't always think of evidence in these terms. Um, often we think of evidence and data as quantitative or qualitative data. And, um, and we struggle sometimes with matching up which kind of data matches which, which kind of question, what data to collect. Um, in the Strengthening Data Literacy Workshop, which will run next week, so that'd be the 14th and the 28th, we're going to dig a little bit further into just the basics of, you know, quantitative and qualitative data, the benefits and drawbacks, methods of data collection. And again, we'll have an hour together, so it's a lot to cover in one hour, uh, but it's important to kind of dig into some of these sort of broader category. So I, I present this to folks so they know that these U.S. Treasury definitions of evidence come from somewhere, are grounded in something, but aren't necessarily the only way that we think about evidence. Um, and as I said before, we're talking about evidence because the U.S. Treasury Department is actually um, focusing on using this evidence-based policymaking act. So they're trying to really push folks in the direction of making more information and building out this function of government. Um, and evidence can be many things. So it could be foundational fact finding. That's actually my favorite thing. I think there's some basic analytics that we just don't generate about our work. And focusing on evidence means that we understand what we actually do how many people we serve, where those people are, how much has changed over time. Um, you know, are we working towards a particular goal? Do we have goals or performance indicators that we're trying to meet? Um, some evidence helps us look at existing policies, do some analysis to figure out, is this working the way we intended? Um, and that, that often is based on program evaluation, either the way a policy is implemented or the way that a policy um, continues to be like sort of ongoing service provision. Really, all of this evidence building creates greater government accountability. So, you know, we all come to work because we want to serve our, our community members, our other citizens and residents of the state. Many of us do work um, that supports vulnerable members of our communities. And at the end of the day, we want to know that it makes a difference in their lives. And um, the Evidence-Based Policymaking Act in the very initial paragraph states, as a government, we want to actually shift how we invest funds from things that we've always done that may not have yielded a great impact to things that make a difference in people's lives. So at its heart, we're trying to actually make an impact. Um, any questions about um, Active the American Rescue Plan, the Evidence-Based Policymaking Act, or any of the ways that this has shown up in your work so far? I'm a parent of two teenagers, so um, sitting in silence for a moment is actually a really nice activity for me. Um, so sometimes when you pause in a meeting and you ask questions and you catch people off guard because maybe they were doing something else or like, oh no, she's paused. All right, I don't see questions, that's okay. 
um, you should feel free to write them down on a post-it note or throw them in the chat, um, send them to me uh, via carrier pigeon, any of those things work. Um, so at its heart, I think this is the way, I think this is the way that the Treasury Department thinks things will happen. If we build evidence, we'll create this data culture. Like I said at the start of our discussion, um, the challenge here is that if there wasn't a data culture to start, it's really hard to build that evidence. And for any folks that have um, filled out that allocation request and said, oh my, what performance indicators will we choose as the agency or how are we doing this now with regular agency business? Um, you know that, that sometimes the foundational elements aren't there. So that's why we're here today. Um, and I, I liked in the in the strengthening data literacy conversation and in past workshops, I actually like to think of this in more of a life cycle kind of format for those scientists out there. So data has to come from somewhere. Someone decides about what to collect. And then you spend some time looking at data and information, understanding what it tells you, understanding its 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 strengths and its shortcomings. And then you have an opportunity to actually, you know, tweak a little bit change the way you think about the data. Maybe there's something wrong with your data collection form. Maybe your data system has actually been truncating information for decades and you didn't realize it. Uh, maybe no one's ever taken a look at one field and realized it's not validated, which means the data appear in all different forms. So there, there are lots of ways where this relationship is really um, very interdependent. And the stronger data culture we can build in our state government, whether in your own agency or across agencies, the better the better will be, the more successful will be to build evidence and ultimately shift the funds that we have in a, you know the limited funds to people who need them and to projects that yield really positive results. So you're probably thinking to yourself, okay, sure, Rachel, this all sounds great, um, but where do we start? And um, and this is a this is a tricky part, so you're just going to have to, you know, really, really bear with me. But the best thing to do is to start with you, where you are. And I think that most folks who um, are here today, while you might have come here by way of the American Rescue Plan funding um, and you, the project that you're associated with, you might not have. Like we have, I, you know, we have many folks here who aren't attached to any American Rescue Plan funding, which is fantastic. Um, and that means that there is a way to think about this work in the context of what you're doing at your agency. Um, so I, you'll see the way I've worded the language here. I talk about projects and programs because, you know, that's what the American Rescue Plan is funding. We're funding projects and programs that agencies or their subrecipients are executing. But often we could be talking about agencies. You see agency in parentheticals a lot. So um, I like to actually, when I work with also nonprofits and folks in the social sector, I like folks to look in their own backyard for the things that you have, the things that you recite chapter and verse every day. And um, I've been using this word and I think it, I think it's effective here. You need to juice those <laughs> for the things that are there in plain sight. So there are a couple of things that you have at your disposal right now. Um, and for projects and programs, you might be looking at that allocation implementation request form where you describe the project and you describe the impact and you maybe outline some performance indicators you're going to track or that the Treasury Department has asked you to track. You yourself might also have questions about your work. How well are we doing? Who are we serving? Some of those really big ticket questions. And then you already have some evidence in your own data system. So whether this is something new that's being funded by the American Rescue Plan Act that's brand new, or whether the American Rescue Plan funding is adding and ex or expanding something existing, you may already have information that you can use to dig into the work that you're doing right now. So I like to first start with thinking about the mission. Um, and like I said, here are some places where you can think about either your agency's mission or your project or program's mission. Um, I've pulled a few of them. So this is a lot of text on one slide, and actually it's really funny because I'm looking at the slide and not your faces. Um, but I, I said to myself, you know, I'm going to look at some agency missions and figure out how they talk about their own work. Now, for what it's worth, on some agency websites, it's very difficult to find the missions. Um, so you might have your mission somewhere internally um, that maybe you don't have it publicly, but as a citizen, it was actually tricky to find some of these. Um, but I pulled the, the mission statements for Department of Housing, 
um, Department of Social Services and Department of Developmental Services. I actually don't think we have anyone from those agencies today. I'm just taking a quick look through our chat thread. So maybe that's so, and, and we're not here to actually um, critique these or tear them down, um, but I just want to be sure that I don't speak out of turn. Okay, no, I haven't. We're, we're, um, so now if I had realized that I was going to have as many people from DCP, I might have pulled your mission as well. Um, if you read through, there are some key words in here that can help you identify what you actually do, the things that you value and prioritize as an organization. So um, when I do these kinds of, you know, when I work with organizations and they're saying, well, we really want to make sure that we're more data and evidence informed. The thing that I ask them specifically is if you look at your mission, how do you actually know that this is something that you're doing ongoingly effectively right now? If you've ever done any kind of community service or, or um, any kind of community engagement, um, it's really Oh, great. Thank you for putting DCP's mission to ensure a fair and equitable marketplace, safe products and services for consumers in the industries that we license, regulate, and enforce. That's a very clear mission. I love that. There's so much there. I would add that in, but it would, um, we can, and we can work with this potentially. Um, I'm, it's, my first question is, how do you know? How do you know that you, um, that you ensure a fair marketplace and an equitable marketplace? Um, and, you know, one of the ways you might measure that is you might think a little bit about violations that you observe and whether violations were at a high in one industry and they've come down um, or whether enforcement actions come down. There's lots of ways to think about this. But when when you pull that mission, when you look at that allocation or implementation request form and you say the goal of this project is X, um, like just yesterday I learned um, that and this was on this is sort of announced in the news that deep will be using American Rescue Plan funding to provide um, swimming lessons to children in qualified census tracts around the state and thinking about pandemic recovery. There's lots of ways that we can thread together different projects. There's lots of funding in here for different kinds of projects. And in this one in particular, I said this is still measurable. How many children are in qualified census tracts? How many children currently are enrolled in swim classes at the Y? Or is there, uh, is there, are there drowning deaths that are at a high rate, which would be terrible? And is there a way that we can adjust and focus on those things? Um, so in this case, um, what I've done here is I've just pulled out and highlighted some of the words and some of the ways that as an applied researcher, I would look at your mission and say, oh, here's how I would measure. Here's how I think you think you know that you're doing this work. And it doesn't take much. This is just, you know, a Word document. It's not, no fancy tools. It's just some highlighting and some underlining. Um, so the first thing to do is to find that project or program or agency mission statement. And if you don't have one, consider drafting one. And that's really more for our folks who are engaged in new projects that don't might not necessarily have a goal. Um, oh, we've got more. Thanks, Nick for putting in DPH's mission, I will add these all to a catalog of mission statements. Um, and DPH has a, you've got like so much data, DCP as well. Um, and there's, I, I get the feedback a lot that folks are like swimming in data and they aren't even sure how to back out how to meet their mission. I feel like Nick, you're, un, are you unmuting or typing? You might be typing, you're typing, okay. A um, little both. Okay. Do you want to, did you want to add in before I moved on? Okay, no, you're like, no, I don't want to say anything about data. No, I'm all set. Um, you know, I've already said it, you know, part of the way that you know is you have to collect information that kind of gets at some of this, some of these things here. And some of these things are really concrete, right? Um, but a lot of these things are really squishy concepts like, access and quality and options and well-being these are great things i want all of these things for myself for my neighbors but it, operationalizing them giving them real concreteness can be a challenge and this is work that I've already done um, in the early childhood space. It's work I've done as an advocate as well. It's work I've done with other social sector organizations. It's kind of like really asking that question, how do you know? So um, as you, you, know, you, 
you have this mission statement, you say to yourself, okay, how do I know? The next question I typically get is, what data should we collect? Especially for projects that are brand new. Well, what data should we collect? And, you know, how, you know, what should we have to demonstrate what we did and the impact that we had? And the question that I typically ask in response is, what do you want to know? Um, and for anyone who's been, and these might feel like really basic questions, like the most very basic, but when it comes to research design or um, or doing this work, um, it, it couldn't be more uh, important to stop, to back up, and to iron out some of these very high level philosophical questions. Because if you don't, what happens is the project proceeds without a lot of governance, with very little data collection, and then all of a sudden, it's um, two years after the CARES Act funding has been delivered and everyone's looking around saying, where did all those funds go? Um, so the Treasury Department in particular is being very, very careful about where these funds are going. Um, but what's what's nice about their um, sort of their detail orientation is it allows us to really take a look at all of the work that we're doing, American Rescue Plan funding work, as well as the other work that we're doing. Um, and when, when I ask folks what they want to know or what they want to show, um, the next thing I encourage them to do is just to look at your actual mission. So ask yourself some of those big questions and you don't have to do this by yourself. This is not up to any one person here. This is, um, you know, leadership team, executive level leadership, uh, because at the end of the day, the way I think about my work is I want the executive of my agency to be able to go out and have insights and facts and things to hold in their hands that they can actually share to demonstrate the impact of the work. I never want that person to be exposed to criticism, even if we choose to make a decision based on the evidence that might not seem in the like in the right direction. Um, and that's how I feel about the all of this American Rescue Plan funded work when it comes to the governor going out to talk about what we've done. We've gotten lots of questions already. Um, you know, budget comes out tomorrow. So um, there's lots of scrutiny around what's happening with these funds. And my goal is to make sure that I know what the big questions are around what we're trying to do with this pandemic recovery work. The same thing applies to either your project or your program or your agency work. So if we were to look at, um, if we were to look back at the mission statements, which we will do in a second, you know, we wanna think a little bit about how do we already know how agency business is going? Are there foundational facts that we're using all the time to say we serve this many people, um, that's grown X percent since last year. Our goal is to do this by next year. Think about the ways that we're already using the data. Because if we, if I, I should have put it back in here. If I hop back to the things you already have in your backyard, you have your mission or your program statement. You have the things you wonder, your questions. And then you already have some evidence about the things that you do already. Um, and that could also serve even brand new projects and helping to understand what to collect. So if we went back to these missions, we would look for some of the clues in plain sight. We would say, okay, well, we know that, for instance, DSS is focused on health and well being. Um, well being is a really big word. Health is like, you know, okay, we can say that's sort of bounded in the sort of like, um, you know, the medical health arena, but when are the lines really squishy and well being might be housing, for instance, or is that purely Department of Housing's mission? So think about the ways that you have things really right in front of you that you can operationalize in the data that you have on hand. Um, and this isn't easy work. This isn't uh, this isn't necessarily work that you should do alone either. So spend some time with this in kind of a workshop format. And this is actually, I think, one way that we can be extremely helpful in the evaluation and impact unit. Either we can create worksheets or uh, materials where you could lead these discussions as a team or we can partner with you and sit with your leadership team or other project teams and help move this work along. So that's absolutely what we're here for, why we've created this work within the data and policy analytics unit, uh, because our expectation is that hopefully this will get scaled to state business, not just the American Rescue Plan work. And some folks on the call have already seen us work in partnership um, you know, with agencies already. So you know that this is work that's sort of active. Um, we're very friendly faces. I know we sit at OPM. Um, but I like to think we have a fun job, um, unlike some of our budget colleagues. Um, so once you look for the clues in plain sight, the way I'm thinking about the way some of these conversations will go is that you actually sit down and document. And documentation is something that um, that folks struggle with, I think, because they think it, it feels silly to sort of write down the basic facts, those foundational facts. But um, you know, when it comes to this time of year, for instance, when it comes to like the start of legislative session, there's a lot of basic education you're always doing around your work. 
And now you have like the basic education you do around your regular work and American Rescue Fund projects that you have to now describe what you're doing and the impact of those things. So I would suggest in building this data culture that you actually assemble a team and you look at some of the data and evidence expectations that, that are expected out of the Treasury accountability and reporting documentation, and then write down some of those big goals and big questions. And it might feel a little silly or foolish at first, and I don't mean to characterize it that way, but it might feel obvious. Well, of course we do these things. But then when you actually look in your backyard and you say, well, how do we show it? Do we show it? What does our pattern look like over time? Are we actually doing what we say we're doing? Um, sometimes when you put things on a little table and you compare year over year, all of a sudden you realize, wow, there hasn't been a big change, or you start to generate some new insights about the work. And often we feel that we don't have the time to do this, but we actually can't spare the time not to do it at this point because it's an expectation of these projects. And once we get into this groove, it's like building muscles. It becomes easier and easier. Um, I like to think of it like a snowball rolling down a hill. So second action step for teams is to document those big questions. Clarify what you actually want to know. And that should help you. What story do you want to tell is another way to think about that. So when you're building a data culture, um, you're not just saying, here's our big mission and here are some of the ways that we measure that mission, but you can also make a statement about, uh, well, and the data tell us that here's how we're doing. We had a tough year last year, but we've made some changes in the way we deliver services based on the way we do the data, looked at the data, and now look, we actually see some changes. And this doesn't have to be just around program implementation, um, or rather program sort of like the big program outcomes. This could be re related to program implementation as well. Um, oftentimes making decisions, we don't, we sort of make what we think are our guesses as to what we're trying to do. Um, so, you know, at the, in the Office of Early Childhood, we were trying to decide, oh, we have this all this funding and we have a third round of funding. How long should we leave the application open? And some people said, well, should we 60 days, 30 days? We have to tell administration for children and families why we made a choice. And I said, well, how long did it take folks to apply in the first round? And we looked back at our data and 95% of folks applied within the first two weeks. So we felt pretty justified to say, can we leave it open 30 days? That's a data and firm choice in terms of program implementation. And it's pretty small, but it helps in terms of we don't have to wait an extra 30 days to do something now because we know that the majority of folks are aware and will access what they need within 30 days. Even small data informed decisions like that help the whole entire group of leaders start to see information as something they can use rather than guess about. I'm gonna pause for a second because I've been talking and talking and talking. I want to make sure um, that folks, if folks have questions or thoughts, because um, we're coming into a section which actually is, a, this is a pretty fun thing. In terms of building your data culture, some things are already ready for you. Okay. Well, the good news is no one has departed yet. We actually gained someone. And we're in the home stretch. Is everyone feeling good? Okay, got some nods on camera. Thank you. Um, actually, it's tough to talk and talk and talk. Um, so we just left off with what do we want to know? And um, sometimes what do we want to know um, can help us ground the conversation. But often we move right past what do we want to know to did we make a difference? And this can be a really difficult thing to demonstrate because it, it may not be just basic analytics that we conduct to actually unpack if we make it made a difference or not. Um, now, it's funny because when I was putting these slides together, um, I my our supervisor in our unit is the chief data, chief data officer, Scott Gall, and I was working with him yesterday and I was just showing him these slides and it's I almost forget sometimes that this is something we do already. So. Are we making an impact is sort of it's demonstrated by the information we have on hand so i said you know you should catalog your data he said you know good news we already do this so um as a state because of the development of the chief data officer role and our open data portal and a lot of legislation we already have great resources on hand to help you with the step so 
just because you might have a catalog of we call what we call high value data, so data that are frequently requested or frequently used, doesn't mean you know how to use it or access it, and that's okay. What I've linked here, you can see, um, is a link to the Open Data Portal where we have a list of all agencies' high value data sets, things that are there that are requested frequently or frequently used within the agency. And we have a list of agency data officers there as well. And I can show these to you at the end if you're interested in seeing me demo. Um, so if you're not sure who your agency data officer is, you can consult with colleagues here on this call. You can consult our list that's on the Open Data Portal and track that individual down. Um, I'm used to working in smaller agencies, even though OPM um, is sort of the agency that serves other agencies, it's still small by comparison to some agencies on the call today. And so sometimes you might not know your agency data officer and that's okay. But your agency data officer or your technology leader may be someone that you can contact to help. Um, and in looking at the data catalog, you're able to take a look at what do you already own that will help you measure impact. Um, and this is where you actually work with folks on projects, programs, leadership, to think about some of the data systems and data elements. And I have kind of like a sample catalog just to show you why this is an important step. Uh, because you know, I actually, I've looked at the agency, I've looked at the catalog and it's there's a lot of information there. So um, consult your data catalog, let's just skip ahead for a second. So this is just a sample, what a catalog could look like. In our, in our high value data catalog, there's many more columns. Um, we ask a lot about whether there's personally identifiable information, um, whether they're um, sort of the some of the deployment and security around those data sets. So some things that are highly technical um, and maybe as a program or, or regular data user might not be of interest to you. But in this case, and this is, um, by the way, this is uh, made up data. This is fake data um, because there's no data system that I'm aware of. That's the adult ed data system, AEDS, or the workforce training data system. But yesterday I was trying to put together things that might be relevant to folks who might be on the call today. So here, what I've done is I've sort of created, um, you know, uh, potential divisions that could exist within a state agency, potential data systems. And then I've offered a few other features of the data. And in this case, as you're thinking about what you want to know and how you measure impact, there are some things that are going to come up. You might get questions like, well, what is the monthly total for something? Um, and if you look, or what is the individual data? And if you look, you only have individual data on two out of your three programs. In this case, you don't have individual data on everything. And that's an important thing to know because then you have to adjust expectations that people are requesting. And maybe they say, okay, we understand you only have individual data on you know, certain things, uh, but we really want individual data on that workforce training program. And so then you have you know, some modifications to make to your data collection strategy and some expectations to manage in the meantime. So when you consult the data catalog, you're gonna learn some things about your own data that you may not even realize. And I've worked with agency colleagues across state government and in my former agency where there were a lot of realizations. People thought, oh, I thought that was a daily thing, or I thought we collected that weekly, and it turns out that the cadence was far longer in between data collection points, for instance. Um, when we report to the U.S. Treasury, we report quarterly. Um, we just finished a reporting cycle for those engaged. Thank you for all of your engagement with my budget team colleagues um, this, that, this past January 31st, um, all on the end of calendar year 22. So that means that we have data now that are more recent than the data we reported in October. Uh, but getting people to understand impact and use data means managing their expectations. Uh, you know, you like I just said, you might you know, collect on a cadence that people want, you know, more data faster. I often tell people this is not Amazon sales data. Uh, we are not moving at such a fast clip, but some of you are. Um, like for uh, folks in that adult cannabis unit, the media definitely wanted to know about daily sales, weekly sales in those first few weeks. And I'm sure that created a fair amount of um, stress in your in your agency. And then there's a lot of questions about equity and many folks who've been doing this work, maybe as program staff once out in the field and now as as leaders within your agencies, you know that sometimes folks are strapped in terms of how you actually um, collect these data, use these data. And so sometimes you might not even realize that you don't have something on hand. So in this case, if someone said, well, I want to know something about race equity. Uh, well, look in that workforce training program, we actually didn't collect race categories. Um, sometimes laws can actually prevent us from collecting data. 
categories or in particular ways. That's true of our childcare subsidy program here in the state. So consulting your data catalog actually helps you sharpen up what you know about the information that you have on hand, and then it helps you have a much clearer sense of where to go to actually measure impact. Now, I didn't circle geography, and my colleagues in the Geographic Information Unit are definitely interested in talking with folks, um, but that's another place where um, we think, oh, we're definitely going to talk about town level information, but look, these data are just collected. Two, two out of three data sets are at the school district level, not at the town level. In some, in some cases, um, you know, this, you might map one to one, but with our regional districts, it doesn't. So sharpening up the way you ask your questions and then matching your questions to what data you have available, all of those things are going to be really, really useful and sort of central to getting this work done right. So once you identify what kinds of questions you have and you document them, you can start to harmonize and fill in gaps. So maybe it's that some of these weekly and monthly need to turn into a weekly data request. Or maybe it's that you have to adjust the geography now and figure out how to get at town level information. Either way, you can work um, and make sure that all of the data sets that you have on hand um, also align and are, work together in a more harmonious fashion. Just to make sure I've got one comment from Pauline. Okay, Pauline has departed, but we're glad that she was here and I'm glad that she'll be able to offer up um, some feedback on the Open Data Portal in the future. So one of the last things I want to leave you with is that when you do these things together, and like I said, this isn't going to happen overnight, um, you crystallize some of these big questions in what the evaluation, the federal evaluation office is calling a learning agenda. Some people might call it a research agenda. These could also be some of your vision statements that follow your mission statements or your action items. I've linked here to some learning agenda tools, um, and if we have enough time, I'll be able to show you this really um, neat little dashboard that the, evaluate, the federal evaluation folks have put together. But your learning agenda brings together that mission, those big questions, and the data that you have into a coherent strategy. And I have some links here where you can gather information from partners. All of our federal funders, Treasury, but other federal partners have learning agendas that they've documented. They range, some of them are 30 pages, some of them are 100 pages, um, but at the heart of them, and we have, we, have a, we have a learning agenda for our statewide longitudinal data system as well that's referred to by other states. The learning agenda is just the questions that, that are just your burning questions that you pursue every day in your work. And the data you generate as a result of that, answer those questions and help your, your agency, your project, your program, all demonstrate the impact that you're having on the people that you serve. Uh, so just to summarize, there are three action steps that you can take right now. Um, locating your agency's mission or your project or program description. Documenting some of your questions. You can do this and present it to leadership. Um, you could do it with the folks working on your projects. You could offer this as a point of advice if you're working grants and contracts to folks who are doing the program execution and cataloging your data. And like I said, the data catalog already exists for you to take a look at. Uh, in terms of next steps, there's a number of things that we can talk through in a future workshop. Uh, there's ways to think about tracking, just regular monitoring, filling in gaps, and then thinking about some of the routine analytics. Most of the time people come to workshops like this because they want me to show them how to make a really cool chart or a really great data visualization. Um, they're like, great, building a data culture. That means she's gonna show us how to make a tree map or how to make a much better looking table. And the truth is that if you don't go through all of these steps and build that data culture from the ground up, there is nothing to put in a cool visualization. Um, there's no way to animate the work any more than I could animate it right now because we don't really know what story we're trying to tell. And so I'm your partner in this work, August is your partner in this work, and the rest of the data and policy analytics unit is really here to support this work. So um, we do have some future plans. I showed this at the kickoff um, because when we work through some of these initial conversations around data literacy and data culture, um, we really want to get into some skill building. Um, we know that folks need support in this area, whether it's um, advanced spreadsheeting, whether it's basic spreadsheeting, whether it's taking your spreadsheets and using built-in um, visualization ideas in Excel, or whether it's using some more advanced tools like Data Wrapper, Tableau, um, or even R. Um, 
we're and whether it's conventions of data storytelling or others, um, we know that there's a need. And so we want to be here to support that need and to have support this need. You, you are the folks joining this community and building this culture with us. So you also get to drive a little bit of what happens next. Um, I do have a I do have a feedback form. I'd love for you to help um, help me with and contribute some contribute some ideas. Uh, so data capacity, um, building data capacity. Oh, why did I say building data capacity? I'd say building data culture uh, meets today and again on the 21st. And it should be a pretty similar conversation or, or discussion. It was really more of a lecture. Um, strengthening data literacy is meeting on the 14th and the 28th. And then what I've done is every Tuesday from 10 to 11, I've scheduled what I'm calling evaluation and impact FAQs. Um, it's just an open drop in hour. If you attend the workshop or don't attend the workshop or just want to have a conversation about your work, um, we are available. And actually, I meant to grab the um, calendar invitation for that. So let me just do that as we're talking. Um, I'll put the invitation info in um, the chat here so that folks have it. And um, I believe that it was also shared in any of the documentation that we have, but here's the Teams meeting um, in the chat right here. So if you wanted to stay and have a conversation or take a break and regroup, we'll have that that office hour every week, at least in the month of February, and then we'll reconvene um, something different in March. And um, we are here to be your partners and to work together on the work and are really grateful for your engagement and attendance today. So um, I would love if there were questions or thoughts or ideas, you should absolutely share them now. Um, and um, if you don't have questions or thoughts or ideas, I could demo a few things, share a few things. Um, the time is really yours. I wanna thank you for joining us today. And if you have, I really would um, appreciate, you know, you can't really improve something unless um, you take feedback about it. So I have a very basic feedback form that I've actually created in a Google product, not in a Microsoft product, so that it doesn't provide, so it provides anonymity. Um, Microsoft Forms for internal folks, um, it definitely tells me who you are. So um, I want to make sure if you have feedback you can offer today, I'd appreciate hearing it. Uh, because we do want to improve this conversation for, for you and for your colleagues. Um, please tell your colleagues about the workshops. Um, and if there's something specific that you have as a need for your team or your agency or your project or program, um, it is our job to support you. And it's also our job to publicize other training opportunities. So um, as we wrap up today, I want to also take the opportunity to just say that we've got a great new training opportunity coming up um, with our um, uh, with our open data portal. And I'm going to post the flyer in this chat as well. So Pauline Zaldonis, who was here, um, has a great set of trainings coming up, and I'm really excited about those. They are um, several weeks in a row, and um, she's done a lot of really great work with the technology company, Tyler Tech Insights. Um, so I've also uploaded here the, so some people may not have access to this file, I am told. So I'm uploading it regardless, and you'll have to tell me, um, if you don't have access to it, please let me know. I'll send a follow-up message with some details on it as well. Um, but with that, we're a couple minutes shy of 10 o'clock. I always love making sure folks have time to breathe, get a glass of water, take a bio break. You have the invitation at 10 o'clock if you want to join. And this is your time to offer questions or ideas or thoughts or feedback. You can just unmute yourselves if you want. You don't have to do that either. You keep all your questions to yourselves um, and just know you're part of a, a bigger group. People are people are happy to be here. Thanks, Carl. I'm really glad you were here today. Um, I'm looking there, forward to learning more as we go on. Uh, we had worked with you for the data collaborative when, with, when, I, when I was with DPH and had worked with local health departments. So I remember getting a lot out of that experience.
Well, thanks, Ramona. I'm really glad. I act, this is my favorite thing to do, honestly, is work with folks to talk about their data. Um, when we get to data storytelling, just we're going to have a lot of fun. And um, for what it's worth, folks, I really feel strongly that I think this virtual format is great. Um, it allows a lot of us to be together easily and quickly. Um, if you think that this would be useful for your agency to be on site together in a workshop format, please reach out because I think that that's really where, um, as, an, as someone external to state government, I felt really almost um, sad that I couldn't do more. Um, and now I'm here. I work in state government. I've been here for almost four years. And um, and this is something that I really have a lot of passion for. And it's and it's our job. So it's my job to help you do this well um, and ultimately to scale this to your regular agency business or program business. So please, please reach out. Um, don't be strangers. And, and there's no question too basic, really, in this arena. Everything you share will eventually end up as an example somewhere in a conversation that will help your agency colleagues or your or your your brother sister agencies across state government. So um, thanks so much for coming today. I'm going to stop recording and we'll make sure to share this recording um, out via various channels.